All right, let's go to the word of the Lord here today. Uh, James, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 1. Let me get it right. Proverbs chapter 9, verse number 1. And then we'll go to the book of James chapter 3. Everybody good this morning? Yes. Wide awake? Yes. I got another good night's sleep last night. I think I slept seven hours, which is good for me. So y'all are in trouble here this morning. <laughs> Amen. Proverbs 9 and 1, wisdom hath built her house. She hath hewn out her seven pillars. Everybody said amen. amen. Now let's go to the book of James, chapter 3 and verse number 13. Who is a wise man and do with knowledge among you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Now when it says conversation, not talking about vocabulary, it means your life, your conduct. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and, be, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly. Everybody say earthly. Yes. Sensual. Everybody say sensual. And devilish. Would you say that? Devilish. Pretty good progression there. For where ending and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easily to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Everybody said amen. amen. My subject today is the seven pillars of leadership. The seven pillars of leadership. Now I'm going to do you a favor. I got ahead of the game here today. Can you believe that? Now, if they'll put it up, there you go. Now, there's the full notes of what I'm about to cover right now. Uh, we usually sell those for $99.99. <laughs> but uh, uh, there it is, amen. You better do it fast, because after this session, it's coming down. Amen. Seven pillars of leadership. Father, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to stand before your people. I'm very privileged and fortunate, God, to be here. I thank you for this meeting. I thank you for the leadership of this meeting. And I ask you to send a special blessing upon it. I ask you this morning to help me to keep my mind clear, to say the things that you want me to say, and to help in the places you want me to help. I need you this morning, God. I want to follow your spirit. And I pray that when we get to the end of this, you will confirm it with signs and you'll confirm it with wonders in the name of Jesus. I take authority in this service right now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you. You could be seated. Amen. I'm not going to go down through a lot of this because you have the notes. You can take them home. I mean, you may not even want to read it. You may just start into it and say, that's a bunch of junk, and just toss it and say, forget it. But uh, first of all, I want to establish the fact that uh, James is going to deal with some things. Now, before I get there, I will tell you that most people teach that the seven pillars of wisdom that Proverbs 9 talks about are the seven attributes of God. And I'm not saying that that's not correct, but I, to me, I'm about to go through the seven pillars of wisdom. All right? The problem in the uh, church at that time was a situation that James had to deal with. And there was a great divide among those in uh, different levels of society. So in the church, you had the rich, you have the owner of slaves, and then you have those who were less fortunate, I would say, and that were slaves and were owned. And so the problem was is that these masters were treating these, and we're talking about Christians, were treating their servants 
very poorly. And so the, in the book of James, the key word is patience. And sometimes we overlook that. The reason why I say that is, is because the leadership kept telling these people, just be patient, God will take care of it, just wait on God, he'll deal with it, just until they finally said enough. That's enough of this nonsense. And they literally started creating armies and insurrection. And now we have wars and rumors of wars. It's in the book of James because of this great division. Amen. The enemy, the enemy uses the same tricks over and over and over and over. Uh, one of the greatest things that he does, and I think that he perhaps uh, really seen this epitomized in the story of the Tower of Babel. When God come down and said, nothing shall be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. And then God uh, separates the languages. He divides the people. And now they can't communicate enough to build. And so I think the enemy has learned from that. As long as we all speak the same language, we can do something for God. But the moment we start speaking something different and there is division in the body, the building ceases. Uh, yeah, hopefully this, you'll relate to this. But uh, when you talk about, um, we talk about homosexuality, we always are quick to say, well, it's an abomination. It's an abomination unto the Lord. Study the scripture. There's some things that's an abomination unto the Lord. There are some things that are abomination to you, and there are some things that are abomination to others. But this one here says that uh, homosexuality is an abomination unto the Lord. Now, we're quick to preach that, but we're not as quick to preach he that soweth discord among the brethren is an abomination. One is sowing discord in nature, the other is sowing discord in brotherhood but it all comes from the same root system. Well, praise God. When you start sowing discord among the brethren or the church, you are in big time trouble with God. Boy, that didn't go over real well. Unity is too precious of a commodity to allow some little pet peeve you have to start causing discord and division. Now, I'm going to tell you, I was planning on teaching something totally different this morning, but the Lord said, I want you to go here. This is what I want you to do, so I'm going to follow it. Amen. Now, apparently, there are those in the church there that were uh, confessing themselves to being wise. I always like people that will tell you what they are. <laughs> Who is a wise man among you and do with knowledge among you? Let him... Uh, shoe out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom so apparently it's uh, I would say it's in the notes this would have been someone who viewed themselves as leaders or teachers someone in the New Testament church was teaching from and even bragging about their wisdom and so this is what James is going to deal with everybody good now, you got the notes there, and I'll just kind of highlight, skim down through here. Uh, in other words, don't tell everybody you got wisdom. Just show them that you've got wisdom. I mean, if you have to, I'm, I, I really beat this up yesterday, but if you have to go around telling everybody what you are, then maybe you're not. Does that make sense? You know, I'm wise. No, you're not. The fact that you said you were wise proves to me you're not wise. <laughs> Maybe I should stop right there. Uh, all right, then let's, let's go down through here. I'll just kind of get over here in my Bible. Uh, verse number, can we put that on the screen, James 3? And uh, this will help me kind of stay on track. All right, who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. 
So if it's real wisdom, it, there's a meekness to it. Because first of all, you recognize this is not my wisdom. This is wisdom from on high. So how can you become arrogant about his wisdom? Boy, it's locked up right there. I mean, all right, 14, but if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against truth. Here you are saying that you've got all this wisdom and, and, and you've got bitter envying and you've got strife. What in the world's wrong with you? You know, here you are telling people how great of a leader you are and all this stuff and all, and, and you like to fight. Well, that went really well. You, you like to fight. There's bitter envy and strife. Uh, I, I won't even take the time to dive into strife the way that needs to happen. But the deal is, is you know, you have to decide in life. Let, let, me, let me explain something to you. I'm already sidetracked. Uh, several years ago, I had a friend of mine who was perceived to be a prophet. And I believe he was a prophet. When he got in trouble in a district, and so he called me. He's going to have to go meet the district board. So he called me and said, I want you to go with me. And I'm telling you, man, I got on my righteous campaign. Bless God, this is an attack against the apostolic ministry. We're not going to stand for it. Yes, I'll go with you to confront that demonic district board. <laughs> and so I, was, I, I called him that morning. I was flying in. I called him just to confirm that he'd be there to pick me up. And so I called, and when I did... Uh, <clears throat> the secretary said, well, he was just right here. I have to go find him. I said, well, have him call me back. So I barely hung the phone up, maybe got five steps, and it rang. And I thought, boy, that was pretty fast. And uh, so I uh, answered expecting it to be him, but it wasn't. There's a lady that uh, she's deceased and gone now, but she played a very significant role in my life. I have no hesitation in calling her a prophetess. Now, if that bugs you, then you better rip out a lot of your Bible. Uh, and so it was her. And uh, she said, uh, hey, Brother Morgan, Sister Chanel. I said, how are you, Sister Chanel? She said, I'm fine. She said, I've been praying for you since about 5 o'clock this morning. Now, this was mm, 7.30, maybe going toward 8. And I said, oh, okay. She said, the Holy Ghost said, it's not your fight. You better stay out of it. I said, excuse me. She said, you heard me. The Holy Ghost said, it's not your fight. You had better stay out of it. Ooh, my Holy Ghost radar is going off right now. And... Uh, she said, matter of fact, and she named the man. She had no idea. This is all Holy Ghost. She named the man and said, they're going to kill him and there's nothing you can do about it. He's got it coming. Well, I was kind of like, oh. She said, I want to tell you a story. I said, all right. She said, when Brother Chenault and I were just newlyweds, she said, uh, I remember which one, but they had a dream. And in the dream, they were in this, uh, what we would call an old log cabin. And uh, they were in there. There's a knock at the door. And their pastor was in there. And there was a knock at the door. And so they uh, opened the door. And the angel of the Lord was standing there. And he beckoned for them to come out. When they come out, her, Brother Chanel, and her pastor, when they come out, she said, oh, Brother Morgan, it was the most beautiful golden field of grain harvest. She said, you couldn't see the end of it. And she said, the angel of the Lord looked at our pastor and said, choose. And he beckoned toward that wheat field, that field of grain. And then he turned and leaning up against that old cabin was three small bundles of wheat. And the angel beckoned, choose. You want this or do you want this? She said, Brother Chanel, I pleaded with him, take the field. The field is the world. She said, do you know what my pastor did? And I said, no. She said, he chose those three small bundles of wheat. And she said, do you know he died a bitter old man, fighting everything and everybody? He pastored three small struggling works. She said, the Holy Ghost told me to tell you, 
choose. You can't hold a sword and a sickle at the same time. Now, what do you want in your hand? Well, needless to say, I fell on the floor. I was sobbing and weeping and blubbering like a fool. And I said, no, I choose the field. I choose the field. You have to decide if you're going to harvest or you're going to fight. Well, praise God. Look what I found. You, you just got to decide. Let me help some of you men with something, okay? You're just supposed to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now, this is me, okay? You teach something different, that's fine. I say, you show me a man who likes to fight. I'll show you a man that doesn't have clean hands. It's always quarrelsome. It's always into it. Nobody can get along. Now, I know there's none of those in uh, Australia or uh, Fiji or New Zealand, wherever we're at. I know there's nobody like that around here. I mean, just always wanting to be argumentative, just always wanting to quarrel. And a lot of these people, and this is what James was dealing with, a lot of these people said, well, we're wise. Everybody else doesn't see it. We're wise. And so this is, uh, man, should I stop right now? I feel like I'm almost going to be by myself up here in a little bit. And so now let's, let's just look at it here a little bit, all right? Everybody still good? Yes. All right. I had a good breakfast this morning, so I can go a while. <laughs> let's go back to the verses. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. 15. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. This wisdom that you're using didn't come. And the reason why we know that it's not wisdom from on high, because first of all, it is earthly, which means fleshly. It is sensual, which means soulish. It is demonic, which means spirit. There is a progression. You start out, if you start out earthly and you don't stop it, it's going to take you to the sensual and then it's going to take you to the demonic and you think that you're doing something for God and the whole time you're not. Oh, somebody help me out up here this morning. I've seen that happen a lot of times. Uh, let's, let's, let's continue on here before you start stoning me. For where envy and strife is, there's confusion in every evil work. I mean, all you got to do is just look around. If, if you leave, how can I say this? If you leave a wake of destruction, you got a problem. Quit saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something for, oh boy. It doesn't work that way. I mean, why in the world would you just constantly, I mean, I know people right now, the Lord told me this. And then they just destroy stuff. And I'm kind of, I told one one time, I said, you're kind of like a bouncing rubber ball. I said, I can't relate to this. God doesn't change. Let me help some of you. God is not schizophrenic. He doesn't say one thing today and then tell you something completely different tomorrow. And why in the world would you say that this is from God? I know that this is from God. When it's not from God, it's coming out of your own heart. It's coming out of your own will. And it's, oh, Jesus, boy, I'm about to get mad. I can, I can tear something up when I get mad. I preach better when I'm mad. I want you to listen. Witchcraft is also mentioned as a work of the flesh. Right? Now, our view of it is it's, you know, black magic, witches with hats, cauldrons. That's witchcraft. That's not true. I know that in the Old Testament it says that witchcraft is rebellion, and I would agree with that. And I think that's a little bit of what works of the flesh are, it's rebellion. But it goes a little further than rebellion. Of course, all of this stems from pride. You get yourself in trouble when you start becoming proud or arrogant about something. Mm. 
You do. You get yourself in trouble. Now, if you're doing that, then here's, here's what I teach. I teach something different. I teach that witchcraft is any means or medium that I use to manipulate, dominate, or intimidate a person or group of people. I think I'm going to come down here. Yeah. I know people who use this. The Lord told me to tell you. Now, was that really God that told you that or were you just telling them that because you want them to do this? You got to be careful when you allow pride to enter into your heart and you think you're the smartest person in the room and that everybody ought to be doing it the way you think it ought to be done. Boy, I need a little help right now. Amen. I, I, I've known people that do that. I mean, they, they're, they're masters at it. They manipulate people. They intimidate people. I've seen people use temper to do it. I mean, the whole family cowers in fear because, oh, no, don't get him mad. Or don't get her mad. <laughs> that felt better right there. Don't get her mad. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and the whole family walks around on tiptoes because they're afraid that once they get upset or angry. I got in trouble one time. I, I mean, Brother Woodward, Mr. Smooth. <laughs> I love you, man. I... You know, I get in a pulpit like I am right now. I just get talking, and then something just pops, and I just kind of jokingly say it. And, and I, I was at home in Oklahoma, and I was preaching, and I said, let me tell you something. I said, when she gets mad and storms off and locks herself in that bedroom, I said, let me give you some good advice. Get you a padlock. <laughs> Lock the door on the outside. Put you some bars over the windows. Leave her in there for three or four days. She'll get hungry enough. She'll want to come out with a changed attitude. I just said it. It's just real flippant. I said it. And, and, mm, I better be careful, you two. And, and one of the assistants in the church come here the next day said, I hope you're happy. I said, uh, happy about what? What you said last night. I said, I, I said a lot last night. What are you talking about? <laughs> he said, my wife's upset. I said, what she's upset about? Because she thinks I wouldn't told you what she does. <laughs> I said, well, fill me in. What does she do? <laughs> she gets mad, storms off in the bedroom, locks herself in there. I said, well, I told you what to do last night. I don't know why you... I'm in quicksand over here sinking fast. You, you, you got to be careful that you don't want your way so much that you're willing to even use the name of God to get what you want. All right, I'm going to go back to my notes. I do a little better when I'm in my, in my notes. I don't get in trouble. All right, let's go back to James 3 on the screen. True leadership is then by example, not by statement. You are the lead ship, getting the other ships behind you to God's intended destination. Others are following not by what you say, but by what you are doing. Would you agree? Amen. All right, let's go on down through here. Uh, the enemy can only work through flesh or thinking that is contrary to God's. When God cursed the serpent, he was to eat dust or work through flesh. The crucifying of Jesus was found in this progression of earthly wisdom. Now, let me, let me say something here. It's easy for you to become the enemy of God. Now, what do you mean by that? I'm, I'm going to go a little further, and, and you're going to say, my God, brother, why do you bring him over here? Because I'm about to use the word Satan. 
You have the potential of becoming a Satan. Right. Amen. <laughs> Simon Peter. Who demands? Oh, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. In other words, God has given you revelation. God's given you understanding. God's given you wisdom to know who Jesus really is. Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona. Now, if you want to open your Bibles and make sure I'm telling you the truth, you're welcome to do it. Six verses later, Jesus looks at the same guy and says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Oh, poor old Simon Peter. It only took him six verses to fall from bless to Satan. Why? One moment's divine revelation. The next thing Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. They're going to, you know. And Simon Peter said, no, 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 you're not. Bless God. We're not going to let that happen. I got a sword. That's not going to happen. He opened his mouth out of his own wisdom. And spoke directly against what God had just declared to him. And you have to be careful when God's speaking to the church or speaking to you. That you don't open your mouth and pop something off because it doesn't fit your paradigm. It doesn't fit the way you think. It's not coming because if it's earthly wisdom you operate by, you're definitely going to have trouble with wisdom from above. And you got to be careful. And this is exactly what the writer was saying is, if they would have known, they would have never crucified him. But because of their wisdom, they thought they were doing something great. Everybody still good? Yes. All right, let me see where I'm at, if I can make heads or tails out of this. Uh, the crucifying of Jesus found earthly wisdom. All right, let's go to verse number 17. We already covered 17. But the wisdom, here we go. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easily to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now, first of all, I think right there he's showing you the seven pillars of wisdom. Now, you're going to count. I know some of you, you're smart enough. You're counting right now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're in false doctrine. Let's look at it, all right? First, what's the first one? Pure. pure. Purity is the nature of God. Therefore, to be pure means to share the character of God. To be pure is to be free from self-interest and to serve God single-mindedly. It requires sincerity and moral integrity, being free from moral, moral imperfections. In other words, one word is also used as chase. Thus, we may express it as having a heart that is free from moral stain. Pure. Peaceable. Everybody say peaceable. peaceable. Peace is ob obviously the key word in verses 17 and 18 since after the first word pure, it begins and ends the list of moral qualities that are the result of divine wisdom. All right, let's, uh, you can read all that when you get home. The rendering peaceable or peaceful sounds too passive. It is also more than simply friendly. Rather, it is peace-loving, peace-making. It's paraphrased by Barclay. It is something that produces harmony between man and man. It is a quality incompatible with jealousy and ambition and is very appropriate to the church situation James was in. In verse 18, James refers positively to those who make peace. So we may translate in this verse, be people who help others make peace. Help others to settle their grievances or to forgive each other. I'm done. The altar's open right now. Now think about it. Think about it. Peaceable. Ask yourself the question, do I leave destruction where I go or do I leave peace where I go? Am I always at odds with everybody, causing division, causing confusion? Or am I one that can help people come together? 
I prayed for somebody last night and asked God to give them wisdom. We're going to do that at the end of my session. Because I'm just going to tell you, you can try to figure out some of these situations. Uh, Brother Harvey, when I went in as district superintendent in my short political career, <laughs> I, uh, this is what I prayed for. I said, God, I don't know how to do this. I'd never been in a board meeting. Well, I'll take that back. The year before they voted me in as Western District North American Missions Director, I had to go in and make a presentation, but I'd never been at a board meeting. I didn't know protocol. <laughs> I, I didn't know anything. You're supposed to read the manual, but I don't even know if I'd ever read the manual. <laughs> and so, well, that went over real well. <laughs> and so, uh, just a lot of this stuff I, I was ignorant of. I, I just didn't know. But when they, when they voted me in, I made this pledge. I said, I'm kind of like Solomon. I don't know how to go out or come in. But I can promise you one thing. I will seek the wisdom of God to lead like I should lead. And that's all I can do. And if that's what we really do, then instead of being known for division and confusion and chaos, we're known as people that can pull things together can bring harmony into situations. Mm. Well, you want to keep going or you want to stop? Let's go to the next one. Gentle. Mm. Mm. That's a good one. This adjective is rendered in a variety of ways. For examples, courteous, considerate, forbearing. Following more or less its use in classical Greek in the sense of strict justice, Barclay paraphrases the meaning of this word is placed side by side with meekness, not quarrelsome. This indicates that the meaning of these expressions are related and parallel. The adjective may therefore be describing the kind of attitude that is tolerant and accepting of other people's different ways. Ooh, it's quiet in here. Not easily aroused and annoyed at what other people do and say. In some languages, the ideal, would, the ideal of being tolerant will be a good way to express gentle. Now, just because I'm tolerant doesn't mean I condone. There's some things that I, I tolerate. I don't condone it, but I tolerate it. Now, when you're operating in earthly wisdom, you don't tolerate stuff. It's got to be your way. I mean, the man last night preached tremendous preaching, Brother Woodward. I mean, tremendous preaching. He talked about that the Jerusalem church was having trouble with the Gentiles. And, and if I got this right, the very guy that's writing this book right here was one of the main ones in Jerusalem <laughs> that was having trouble with the Gentiles. <laughs> Maybe he's just writing it to himself. I don't know. Amen. <laughs> Can, can, you be to, can you be gentle? Can you be tolerant? You want to go on? Yes. Did I cover that one? Easy, easy to be entreated. Basically, it means it's open to reason. Mm. Well, that's a tough one right there. In Greek, this is a single word and is used only here in the New Testament. Its meaning is very close to gentle. This is seen in the fact that the word considered has been used to translate both gentle and and open to reason that the word has a wide range of meaning. It's seen in the various translations, easy to be entreated, reasonable, sensible, never obstinate, willing to yield, compliant, open-minded, friendly, conciliatory. Anybody fit those qualifications here today? <laughs> no doubt every rendering brings out part of the total meaning of the word. In general, it describes someone whose mind is not closed who is not insistent but always willing to listen to other people's views and ready to be persuaded. Boy, it is so quiet in here right now. You're supposed to be teaching leadership. This is the best I can do on teaching you leadership right now. Matter of fact, I got some of you right now. Your spirit's getting stirred up because the word has found you today. Woo. And don't push that button. 
full of mercy and good fruits. The fact that the expression includes an and indicates the two parts are to be taken together. Indeed, it is possible to take this as a hint of days, indicating that the whole statement should be understood as expressing one ideal. If so, it may be understood as full of mercy that brings about good fruits, meaning showing compassion to those in trouble and in need. It is one of the distinct qualities of God himself. Mm. We still here? To have true wisdom, a person has to be compassionate and has to produce kind deeds to show it. To keep the image of good fruits, we may render it as produces a good harvest of good deeds or produces a rich crop of kindly acts. Man, I don't know if this is going over or not right now. You want to go on? You want me to stop? We're almost there. Without partiality, without uncertainty. This word is only used here in the New Testament, and its exact meaning is very difficult to define. This is reflected in a number of different renderings. Without partiality means free from prejudice, wholehearted, unambiguous, without inc inconstancy, unwavering, straightforward, genuine, free from doubts and hesitations. Here again, all these components are in, interrelated and overlapping. Therefore, context and general uses in the given language will be deciding factors in determining the meaning. In this context, impartial or without prejudice appears to be the best. This is in accord with James' concern about impartiality expressed in chapter 2, verse 8 through 13. And we note that in that context, he also mentions the importance of mercy. This meaning is also closely related to the next adjective, without, sin, without insincerity. It reflects James' tendency to pile up similar related concepts as seen also in the use of gentle and open to reason or friendly. Without partiality. Wow, man. I think some of you want a refund now. <laughs> without hypocrisy, number seven. Without hypocrisy, that means without insincerity. It describes something that is genuine without pretense being fruit, truthful to others. And the New Testament is also often used in the sense of genuine or sincere to modify some important qualities such as love and faith. The double negative without ins insincerity is best rendered in the positive form sincerity. Another possible rendering equivalent to sincere in this context is straightforward. It has also been observed as impartial. A person that is sincere, impartiality and sincerity go hand in hand. In many languages, it will be necessary to use verbal expressions all the way through this verse. The following may serve as an alternative translation model. But Christians who have this wisdom that God gives, first of all, have hearts unstained by sin. They are also peacemakers. They're tolerant toward others and friendly. Their hearts are full of love for other people. And this produces a good crop of merciful or kindly deeds. They also have no prejudice toward others and are sincere. Mm. You ever had the word of God find you? There's some, there's some chapters in the Bible I'd just like to rip out of it. <laughs> no, seriously. Because I get to feeling pretty good about myself and then I get over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. <laughs> and it will definitely tell you where you're at. And if I had my way, I'd just rip 1 Corinthians 13 out of the Bible and say, I don't know what happened to it, God. I guess we lost all the love there is. Sometimes the word of God just finds you. And if it does, don't be foolish and act like it's not talking to you. That's your pride working on you right now. One of the hardest things there is, is to say, I'm wrong. I heard a preacher preach years ago. He said, uh, he, his, he, he preached on the only way to be right is admit you could be wrong. And the way to be wrong is to always say you're right. You have Burger King here? I know you have McDonald's. You got Burger King here? Yeah, it's a different name. What, what's their slogan? Uh, beggars and veterans. 
no, no, that ain't going to work then. <laughs> Y'all mess everything up over here. In the States, Burger King's slogan is, have it your way. And that's how a lot of people try to operate. Now, I'm talking to leaders here today. I'm not talking just to saints. I'm talking to leaders. You can't always have it your way. You can't dig your heels in so much and say, I don't care. This is the way we're going to do it. This is what I have decided to do. And I could care less what anybody else says or thinks. It's probably my last time to turning point. Uh, let me find out where I'm at here. James 3.18. The harvest of righteousness is sown in peace. Let me give you a translation. We need only to take the total meaning into consideration while not abandoning other possibilities, the interpretation, therefore the resultant translation that appears to fit. The context best is this. An harvest or seed of justice is produced or sown in a spirit of peace by those who promote peace. What do you promote? Yourself? Your agenda? I'm telling you, I got a little headwind right now. It's got a little resistance, but that's all right. I'm used to that. Amen. Uh, we, can re, we can restructure this sentence as justice is the harvest reaped by peacemakers from seed sown in the spirit of peace. We can also restate this as an active form. For example, peacemakers who sow in peace and the spirit of peace will harvest justice. If translators in certain languages cannot use the metaphor of planting peace, they may express this verse as, when peacemakers bring about peace between people, the results is that justice is done. Now, can I give you a verse here, and I'm going to mess up. I'm going to mess up a bunch of Pentecostal theology. You ready for it? Uh, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'll be in their midst. You ever read that, yes. heard that? Most of the time we use that verse when there's not hardly anybody in the church service. <laughs> Just a handful of people. We don't need a big crowd. Where two or three are gathered together in his name. He'll be there. And, and I believe that. I, I definitely believe that, but... The reality of that verse is in what, Matthew 18, that's talking about reconciling and you having something against a brother and the procedure that you're supposed to take in order to resolve the conflict. Are you with me here? Now, boy, I'm telling you, I feel something in the spirit right now. Um, what that means is you've done everything you're supposed to do and finally, you've got all the witnesses together You've got the one that has a grievance. You've got the one that get, you got all this together, and you finally got it resolved. And when you finally get two or three gathered together and you get this dealt with, I'll show back up. But until you get that done, I'm distant. That's the reason why the enemy does everything in his power to create an offense in you and to get you mad at somebody and get you to have all against somebody. And you think you're going to go to heaven? I don't care who you are. According to the scripture, and you're, oh boy, this is where I get in trouble. You're supposed to be a leader and you got awed in your heart. That means your prayer is going to hit that ceiling and bounce right back down. You're supposed to leave that gift, prayer, at the altar. Go take care of this situation. And then return. Step further, husbands and wives, if you can't get along and you're bickering all the time, according to the scripture, your prayer hits that ceiling and bounces right back down. The enemy knows that. So here's how he renders prayer non-effective. He just gets you to have ought against somebody or gets you mad about something. Oh, boy. I, yeah, I, I am. I am. I am. I am. I am. I don't know how long I've been going, but, but here's the deal. Uh, have you ever read over there in, in John's epistle where he talks about, and if your heart condemn thee not, then is thou confidence toward God. You ever read that? Yes. And then whatsoever things you ask, you receive of him. Yes. Because you've kept his commandments, right? 
Now, what are the commandments? It's not the 10 commandments. There's only two commandments in the New Testament. And if you get those two down, you don't need the other eight. If you don't get those two down, you're going to mess up all the other eight. Does anybody know what the two commandments are? Love God and love your brother. See, if you love God, you won't have false idols. If you love God, you won't take his name in vain. If you love God, all the stuff you believe. If you love your brother, you won't steal from him. You won't commit adultery with their wife or husband. And it just keeps going on right down through there. But the whole thing hinges on loving God and loving each other. And the enemy knows that. And if your heart condemns you, you know what that really means? If you go to God in prayer and your heart is saying, there's somebody I don't love. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care if you pray 23 and a half hours a day. If your heart's condemning you, you don't have confidence toward God. But if you get that out of your heart and get that out of your spirit, then you can ask whatsoever and God will honor your prayer request. Let me tell you what that hinge is on. Boy, I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't know what was going on all over this. You go, Brother Woodward, please put some healing bomb in this after I'm done. <laughs> you know, here, here's, 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 here's the setting or the context. If you see your brother half need and you shut up your bowels of compassion, how say you the love God abides within you? For you're not the love in word only, but in deed, right? You know what he uses as the backdrop for that? Cain and Abel. Read it. It's in there. Did you know... Did you know that when God asked Cain, where's your brother? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? That's exactly what John meant when he said, if you see your brother have need and you shut up your bowels of compassion, how say you the love? You know what you're saying to God? Am I their keeper? They got themselves in this mess. I'm not my brother's keeper. Let me help you. Yes, You are supposed to be your brother's keeper, not the one to destroy him, not the one to cripple him, not the one to criticize and to critique. You are supposed to be your brother's helper. Now, if you really... All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Now, now here we go. I, I, I believe in signs, wonders, and miracles and all this stuff. I really do. I, I believe in that. I believe in it strongly. I've given my life to preaching this kind of stuff. But the other day, the Lord kind of dealt with me. He said, it was not miracles, signs, and wonders that got Jerusalem's attention. Oh, yeah, Brother Morgan. You know, it talks. No, 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 no. That's not what got Jerusalem's attention. Let me tell you what See, our problem is we seek power. That's what we seek, power. I want more power. What you gonna do with it? No, seriously, what are you gonna do with all that power? Affirm you? Prove to everybody that you're powerful? The the hunger for power can come out of your human Nature. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. Three temptations of Jesus. Remember that? Three temptations of Jesus. Lust of the eye. I get that. That's the kingdoms and the glory. There it is. You want no? Lust of the flesh turns stones into bread. But the pride of life, that's the pride of life would be related in that, in the deal is there's, there's three Categories, right? Less of the eye, the less of the face, the pride of life. So how in the world is the pride of life got anything to do with asking Jesus to jump? I'll tell you why. Because the devil was tempting him to use, use God's power to prove to him, the devil, you're who you say you are. And when you want the power of God to operate in your life as an affirmation to your enemies and to your brethren that you are really somebody, that's out of the pride of life. Why do you want miracles? Why do you want miracles? Now, I'm I'm messing this whole thing up right now. Here's the deal. 
the miraculous in the end time is not going to come from faith. And if you think, bless God, if we just call fire down from heaven, that proves everything. Seriously? The enemy in the end time, the Antichrist and his prophet going to call fire down from heaven. So what in the world? What, what is the key to all this? Number one, I don't need the power of God to affirm me. That's, that's coming out of pride. But let me tell you what the church needs a fresh baptism of. It's the love of God. It's loving each other, loving one another, loving him. If you don't love a brother, don't say you love God. I didn't say it, John said it. He said, you're a liar, you're in darkness, and the truth is not in you. Well, you just don't know what they did. Well, what did you do to Jesus? Oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. I didn't plan for this to go this way. You, you know, I, I know we teach and preach all the time. Once you are forgiven for your sins, God buries it in the sea of forgetfulness, never to bring it back up again. That's not really true. Because you can cause him to bring it back up. Yes, you can. Oh, Guy went in, owed the king 17 million, whatever it was. The king forgave him, sent him on his way. He goes out, and the guy on the street owed him $17. He said, pay up. The guy said, I can't pay up. He said, all right, I'm going to put him in a debtor's prison. After the boy had just left the king, and the king had forgiven him all that debt. And the word got back to the king, and the king said, bring him back in. And they brought him back in. He said, is it true that I forgave you $17 million? And you wouldn't forgive somebody that owed you $17? That is correct. Now watch it, watch it. He said, reinstate the debt. Put him in prison and deliver him to the tormentors. I want you to listen. The moment that you choose not to forgive, things are reinstated to you and you end up in a spiritual prison and you are tormented. That's why the love of God and forgiveness, which I think is closely related there, that's why it's so important. That's why the enemy works on you. Let, let me help you. How else does he really help you with love without sending some really stupid people in your life? Maybe you're not supposed to use that word here. It's the best one I could think of for the moment. There are what I call agents of crucifix that are going to come into your life. I, I, I did this one time. Now, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't going to kill myself, but I, that's the first original lapel mic right there. I, 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 went, I went outside in the garage and I got a hammer and nail, and I, I could reach over. Well, then I could. I could reach over and I could drive my feet to the, nail my feet to the cross. And then I could hold the nail over here in my hand and I could reach over and I could smack it in. I didn't, I'm just testing it. Now the problem is I got a hand over here. How do I put a nail in it? So God says in order for you to be crucified, I'm gonna have to send people into your life to help you. These are agents of crucifix. God said, I need them in your life so you will die out. Mm. Did you know that he called, uh, he called Judas his friend and he called Peter, as I said, his enemy? Why is Peter his enemy? Because he's trying to keep him from doing the will of God. And he calls Judas his friend, which is moving him toward the will of God. And so God sends people into your lives that you, they, they lie, they cheat, they, they do all kinds of crazy stuff. And brother, you're ready to go get the sword. I'm dealing with a situation right now. I, I promise you I'm dealing with a situation right now that if I had my way, I'd already severed that guy's head right off his shoulders <laughs> and handed it to him and say, now you need to keep your mouth shut. But I'm, Sister Morgan, I'm proud of myself. Was in a meeting and he popped off and did some of that nonsense and I could feel it starting. Mmm. Mmm. 
all right, God, now's a good time to call fire down and just nuke this old boy. <laughs> nope. I controlled myself. I didn't retaliate. I didn't get into it with him. Now, there was a day in my life I would have. But Sister Chenault told me this one time. She said, Brother Morgan, the gifts operate from, through, and by love. It's going to take you a while to learn this, but you will. And I'm telling you, growing up as a younger preacher, Brother Woodward, I had a quick trigger finger. I really did. I mean, God could show me something. I didn't care if it embarrassed you or not. I'd just call you right out. I've had people stand, you, you're committing fornication. You need to stop that nonsense. I mean, I just, you know. But through time, God began to deal with me and show me some things and said, I don't need you to operate in my power there. I need you to operate in my love. What would I do in this situation? Now, am I making sense? Now, let me close. I think I'm getting close to my closing time. Let me close with this. One power that convinced, it was Jerusalem. It is when they seen those people selling their possessions, bringing it and laying it at the feet of the apostles and them dispersing it. It was so pure and it was so out of love that when two people threatened to hinder that, God said, I'm not going to put up with that in this environment. Don't bring your lie into here. This is too pure. You know who I'm talking about? Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Ghost. They got up there and pretended. It wasn't what they gave that got them in trouble. It's just say they pretended to give God. If they had walked in and said, you know what? We sold some property. We gave God 40%. There you go, God. They had lived a they lived in a ripe old age, but they didn't do that. They walked in there and said, this is what we sold it for. Here it is. And God said, not in here. Because it's against human nature. Power can be craved out of your human nature. But when they see us loving one another and they see us helping one another, that's what's going to convince the world. I know, I know some of you are like, oh, no, 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 we need more power. No, no, we don't. By this. Shall all men know that you are my disciples? Not your hair length, not your dress length, and some folks probably their tongue length. None of that. And I believe in all of that. He said, you know, and here's the thing. You can get all dressed up. I mean, you can look like, what, what's the word I want to use? Paul Pentecost and Sally Pentecost. I mean, you could look, the, you could fit the part, you can do that stuff and all, but not operate in the true love of God or operate in the wisdom of God. You operate, I've seen people dressed up. Now, you guys won't understand what I'm about to say, but this is the best thing I can come up with. They all dressed up, but they're meaner than junkyard dogs. That's mean. They go around telling everybody they're holy. There's no wisdom. There's no love. They destroy other people. If you don't agree with them, whew. if they can't control you, Well, maybe I shouldn't have got into all this here today. No. no I, I forgot my watch. All right. Just take a break there a second. Uh, Oh. Is it on there? I didn't hit the start button. <laughs> I, I really didn't. I, <laughs> you don't know if that's by accident or not. What kind of revival? What kind of revival could we have if we would love each other, operate in the wisdom of God, and let God guide us by his hand and by his wisdom instead of us calling all the shots? You, 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 you hit it. So what, what time, seriously, how long have I been going? Yeah, about now. 
I'm at right at an hour. You're timing me. Is that what it is over there? Yeah, okay. All right, let's see. There was a man, this is in conjunction with what Brother Wood was saying last night. There was a man that I knew who'd went on, I mentioned this recently. If I did here, act like I hadn't said it. But he went on this uh, seven days of fasting. And about the third or fourth day, did I tell you all that? Okay. I've been to so many places I can't remember. And about the third or fourth day, the, uh, he said, it was seven-day fast. He's in the building. He said, Brother Morgan, God gave me a vision. He said, now, I'm not a man given to vision, but God gave me a vision. And he said, in that vision, there was a, a, a field of grain, just golden wheat grain. And he said, there was a man out there with a little riding lawnmower. And said, he was mowing. And said, there was a man that appeared to me. He said, I assumed to be an angel of the Lord. And he said, you know who that man is? He said, no, who is it? He said, that's you. And that's how much grain you're harvesting. But if you'll come with me, I will show you God's intent for the end time. He said, Brother Morgan, we walked over. There's this massive building. And we stepped in it. And he said, there was a combine. How would I explain combine here? Harvester. Harvester. Now, the way it works in America is it's not just one single blade. It's several blades. It's not just a 42-inch mower. It's several feet across the head of it. He said, I walked in and I seen this. He said, I, I can't even tell you how massive it was. I started to use the word huge, but it sounded like a Donald Trump word, so I'm not going to do that. Amen. <laughs> and he said, I, I, he said, this angel said, climb up in the seat. He said, so I climbed up in the seat. And he said, when I did, he said, uh, the angel of the Lord said, what do you notice? He said, Brother Morgan, I got to looking around. And I, I seen that this thing didn't have a steering wheel. And he said, I told the angel, it doesn't have a steering wheel. And the angel of the Lord said, that's correct. Because this end time harvest can only be directed by the Holy Ghost. What would happen? See, we all got our little riding line mowers wherever we're from. But what would happen if we all would come together to create a combine? Combining together. Joining ministries together. Joining networks together. Not you over there and them over there. Go ahead, little hot shot with your little riding line mower. See how much you get. But what would happen to this part of the world if all of a sudden we get over all this nonsense about you're there, I'm here, you're over there, I'm back over here. If we get rid of all of that and we would join hand in hand with our brothers and our sisters and we would seek in prayer the wisdom of God. See, God's got a plan for your city. God's got a plan for your... I, I want every, every, and I, I'm sorry, I want every district superintendent that's here, I want you to stand. If you're a superintendent of a nation, I want you to stand right now. I mean, all right. Where are you? Uh, I live in Kansas, but this is my region. What is it now? <laughs> I can't see you, man. I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm um, half of Queensland and the whole of New South Wales. Okay. Where do you say? New Zealand. New Zealand. All right. Australia? Is that all we got? We got one more? Where's he at? You gonna stand? Point him out. So you talking about him? Talking about that guy back there? At their point, yeah, stand up. Where 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 are you from, sir? Fiji. Fiji? Where do you say? Fiji. Fiji? I'm supposed to have hearing aids. I really am. <laughs> Matter of fact, the year I had open heart surgery, they told me, you need hearing aids. I said, I'm not going to have open heart surgery and get hearing aids in the same year. <laughs> My wife and I are just about to get a divorce. She said, I get so tired of repeating myself. For the love of God, would you get those hearing aids? What would happen? Here's the thing. The wisdom of God will come to you 
if you seek it. Mm -hmm. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of the Lord, which upbraideth not, but giveth to all men liberally. If we would quit trying to do it our way, and we would seek God and say, God, what is your plan for the harvest in Australia? What is your plan for the harvest in Fiji? 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 I mean, all these countries that are represented here. Seek him. You're not going to read out of a book. You're not going to get to go to some conference and them tell you 10 steps to have a harvest, 10 steps. Because every culture is different. Every nation is different. You can learn principles. I'm not against that. But what you've got to do is you've got to get yourself in prayer. Jesus, help me right now. Brother Woodward, I'm not trying to infringe on your time. I'm really not. Years ago, just if you guys remain standing, years ago, uh, a, a lady that I have a lot of respect for had a vision in the vision. I know I talk a lot about visions, but God does speak in dreams and visions. So that's why you need to slow down and listen or go to sleep. Personally, he speaks to me in dreams. That's why I try to sleep a lot. I want to give him plenty of time to speak to me. But in it, she's seen a table. Boy, I feel the Holy Ghost. She's seen a table. And she said, Brother Morgan, at that table was the Antichrist. And like his cabinet. And they long table. And she said, and sending across from them, she said, now there were some empty chairs on this side. She said, sitting across from them was some apostolic preachers. And she started naming some of them, which I want. And she said, the preachers were perplexed, frustrated, confused. The Antichrist in them was very confident. And she said, all of a sudden, I seen the hand of God come out of the heavens. And said, he took some papers and stretched across the front of the preachers. And she said, God allowed me to see it. It was a military strategy. And she said, when those men of God got to reading that, she said, all of a sudden, the enemy starts becoming perplexed. And the men of God started becoming confident in faith. Now, I, I'm, I'm not going to go into this, but thou prepares the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That's really what that's talking about. Anytime two opposing sides are going to go to battle, they have to come sit down and talk about the terms of engagement. That's what the psalmist was talking about. So whenever there's something about to happen, God brings the enemy to one side of the table, and then he chooses, he chooses those to sit across from them. So let me just put it to you like this. There's a, there's a spirit that sits across from Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, wherever else. There's spirits that sit across. What we can afford to happen is for the other side to have an empty chair. Because if we will just sit in our place, find our chair of authority, operate in the authority of God, and operate in the wisdom of God, God will give a divine strategy. I said God will give a divine strategy for every nation, every community. Now, if you're a local pastor, it fits for you. Just go seek God. Just, just sit down next to you, across from you, and tell the enemy, listen, you may think you've got me outnumbered and you have me outmaneuvered, but my God is going to give me a plan. My God is going to give me the weapons that I need. My God is going to give me the wisdom that I need to combat you and to fight you. And think what happens if all of a sudden these guys are start getting together. And, and I think you are. I'm not... But they all start getting together and joining together. One can put a thousand, two, ten thousand, three, a hundred thousand. Uh, let me give you a number. If you do that math, by the time you get to seven, you have a number that's larger than the world's population. What would happen in the end time if seven men of faith and wisdom would combine together and join together? What would happen in this region of the world if seven apostolic leaders got together, they got rid of their prejudice, they got rid of their bias, they got rid of their ideals, and they agreed together that God is going to give us a strategy. 
I ask today that the wisdom of God would flow into this service right now. Woo. All right, leaders, come on up here. Just come up here. I know it's, what is your tea break? All right, I'm messing your tea break up. Come on up here, all you guys that were standing, come on up here. Come up here. Would you come up here and join together? I assume all y'all like each other. If you don't, <laughs> it's not a good place for you to be standing, amen. <laughs> all right, come on. Combine. It's a combine. Everyone affects the other. It's a combine. Am I making sense? Now, they're going to pray for each other, and they're going to pray for the wisdom of God to come to them and their nations that they represent and also in this region that they represent, this part of the world they represent. Now, here's what else I need right now. If you're a pastor or a leader, I want you to come up. Don't press them. I just want you to come up and fill all the way across the front up here, and I want you. You're going to join together in prayer also. Come on. Pastor, leaders, come on. Come on. Come on. I think this is called turning point, is it not? I think right here is where God turns some things. He turns it in the spirit. You came one way, you're going to leave a different way. You came with one ideology, you're going to leave with something else. It's not because of what the preacher said. It's because of what the Holy Ghost said to you. I personally believe that if these men, and I believe they are, are sincere, that within just a few seconds time, that God will speak directly to every one of them and speak his wisdom to them, give them a word that they need. Are y'all with me here right now? I believe every one of you standing up here, I believe that God will do that for you right now where you're standing up here. If you just ask him, Lord, according to your word, if any man lack wisdom, and God, I need a boatload of wisdom right now on my situation, my home, my family, my church, those that I'm leading, I need the wisdom. Give me the word. That, come on, let's pray right now. Get, join together. I'm, I want you to join together, and I want you to pray right now. Something's about to happen in the Holy Ghost. Don't let any spirit into this body that would cause a cancer to form or cause division to happen. Woo! Yetamora bahashato makai. Lord, according to your word, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of the Lord, which upbraideth not. You're not here to withhold your wisdom, but let us replace our wisdom and earthly wisdom with a heavenly wisdom, a wisdom from on high. Speak into my spirit. Let me have those seven pillars to build wisdom in my life. I speak it in that. Come on, the Holy Ghost is flowing right now. Woo! Let God bring something together. Let God bring something together. From this place. From this place. From this place. Let there be a combining of harvest and ministries. Woo! Give us a great harvest. Lead us and guide us into that harvest together. I'll not go by myself, but I'll join with somebody else because we can harvest a lot more together. Woo! Father, speak to everyone standing up here that sincerely is asking you. Speak wisdom to them right now. Impart wisdom to them right now. Peacemaker. The word to use, peacemaker. Jesus' name. Lemando roboko shatana mahakai. Yes. 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 Yes.